Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Tabernacle. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors. Are you glad to be here? I hope so. We want to welcome those uh, who are worshiping with us in Manistee and wherever you're uh, uh, dialing in, if it's at a home church or you're by yourself or it's three months from now, uh, uh, you need to get a better calendar. But uh, we're glad that you're here uh, with us. We're coming to the end of our little series uh, for the dog days of August now that we're into September. Uh, and it's just been an accumulation of things to get us ready for what we call our kickoff. The series is called It Needs to Be Said because sometimes we have these messages that don't necessarily fall into like an expository series going through a book of the Bible, what have you. And so we just put them all together. And we have this week and next week uh, with It Needs to Be Said. And uh, at, at tr true to form, I usually have a lot of things that I think needs to be said. So forgive me, I, I've got three things this weekend that needs to be said, not just one. Uh, uh, you didn't think that was funny? <laughs> At least it's typical, right? At least it's typical. Um, but it is good to see things start to somewhat feel like normal. No, it doesn't feel like normal at all. It, it's still weird here in the People's Republic of Michigan, is it not? And uh, uh, if, if, if I get out of my car one more time and get all the way to the door, <laughs> and then I see that, oh, stink, forgot a mask, and then have to, I mean, we're getting our exercise, aren't we? Anybody else have that happen at least, fit, yeah, 50% of the time, it's like, oh, oh, stinking mask, it's not normal yet, right? This kind of became really clear for me um, at the beginning of this past week, uh, I have this little news feed on my phone, and I saw a headline, and for some reason, the headline just struck me. And uh, um, so I had to click on it. In fact, I, I took a screenshot and I wanted to share it with you. And this is from NPR. That's just a screenshot of my phone. And it says, six million coronavirus infections now confirmed in the U.S. A country in limbo. And what grabbed my attention? I just want you to look. I, I had that highlighted right there. A country in limbo. Now, there's some things that need to be said, but this isn't the forum for them. So I, I just know that what's going through many of our minds, not because I'm a mind reader, it's because I live and breathe and operate in this world too. Some of you don't even believe that headline. You see 6 million and you want to show me 18 other websites. Well, were they really confirmed cases or were there pre-existing? And there's other people that are like, no, it's probably way more than that. I'm pretty sure I had it and have had it four times. Which speaks to the headline, we're a country in limbo. If ever there's a time in the United States, and I'm so sick and tired of coronavirus, COVID, quarantine, mask references in sermons, forgive me. But this headline, I had to put it up there because it's true, it seems to be that there, the country is in limbo. Which way is up? Who's right? Who's telling the truth? What's open? What's not open? That gone it, I forgot my mask. Right? It's a country in limbo. And the reason that I put it up there, and this is where we're going, there's why there's three important things as we're in September and school's about to start. For some of us, school has started. We're getting back more into a routine. These things need to be said. What crossed my mind was this. The country is in limbo. Election year, protests, chaos, pandemic, maybe, maybe not. What about the church? What about the church? What about us? One church in two locations, in two physical locations, but if we're honest, we're one church in multiple locations. Still have people meeting as part of home churches or in, in couples or as a family or individually. What about the church? Is the church in limbo? Is the tabernacle in limbo? Friends, I want to be honest with you. It feels like it, but it ought not be. We don't play that game here. The church don't limbo, friends. That's about as low as I can go. 
because the church belongs to Jesus. And because the church and the message of the gospel has to be bigger than all of the chaos and the uncertainty. You know, we were talking about this just before the service uh, with, with some staff people. If you think about where our nation is right now, there's deception on all sides. There is truth and untruth being argued about on all sides. There is fear like there's never been except in wartime. Maybe going all the way back to the days after Pearl Harbor was bombed. So we have deception of all kinds on all sides. We have fear on all sides. We have chaos and unrest. Who is the author of all of those things? We have an enemy who lives, exists, Scripture says, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. God is not the author of chaos. He's an author of order. God is not the author of deception. He is the way and the truth and the life. God is not the author of darkness. He came as the light of the world. And where, and where his light shines, truth gets exalted, right? Right? And so as I saw that headline, I knew that I had to share that this week. This cannot be true of the church. Not this church, not any Jesus-preaching, Bible-thumping, God-fearing church. The church cannot afford ever to be in limbo. I'm a little bit worked up. So I got three things that needs to be said, and we're going to look at three different scriptures um, the first one I'd like to share with you is in Matthew, and, and it's one that's familiar to so many of us. It's just some, in fact, it's only a part of a verse. It's something that Jesus said, and we have to remind ourselves. In Matthew chapter 16 and uh, in verse 18, he said to his disciples, and specifically to Peter, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when I say the church can never be in limbo, there's a verse. The gates of hell can't prevail against it. A bad economy can't prevail against it. World War I and World War II couldn't prevail against it. The American Revolution couldn't prevail against it. Pandemics in the Middle Ages could not prevail against it. Paul Pot could not prevail against it. Neither could Mussolini. Neither could Stalin. Neither could a communist Chinese regime that tried to stamp it out could not prevail against it. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What am I driving at? Here's the first thing that needs to be said. It needs to be said to the tabernacle in all locations. Those that are listening this weekend and those that won't be listening for three weeks. And that's simply this. The mission doesn't stop. The mission doesn't stop. I'm going to keep saying it until I get an amen. The mission doesn't stop. Amen. We're about loving God and loving people and making disciples. That's the mission. That's the mission, plain and simple. And we discovered through a couple of months where we weren't physically meeting that we could continue to love God and love people and maybe some disciples were made but the making disciples part of the factory has kind of get, it's been pushed into limbo. Because this is what we found out. I like watching church online. I can access it whenever I want. And it's been going on for a couple months. And guess what? God didn't strike me dead. Right? Now, please don't get me wrong. There are some folks that need to continue to stay in quarantine. I was just on the a phone just today with, with a really dear friend of mine named Bob who's like, yep, my family, they're really worried. He's older in years. It was his birthday yesterday. And he's just like, yeah, we got to keep watching online. That's what we got to do. And I said, you do that. You do that. I'm, I'm not talking about who's coming to church and who's not. We all have to make those decisions and who's going to wear a mask and who's not. What I'm driving at is the bigger picture that the mission 
doesn't stop. And my fear, as one of the pastors here, is that the engine room that cranks out disciples, that teaches people the Bible when we come together in relationship, when we look for opportunities to serve, to serve the poor, to serve each other, to serve by being a domino in the community, inviting people to Christ or inviting people to a Bible study or inviting them to, it's, it's kind of, it's in limbo. It's in limbo. Now, Look at my face. I'm smiling. Because guess what? God's people have been faithful. Finances are great. They're great. Attendance is growing physically. Attendance continues to be strong online. But the real work of making disciples, you know what that takes? That takes men and women and students that are committed to do the hard work of the mission. The mission doesn't stop. Are we to be the generation that says, you know what, the fear and the uncertainty of political unrest and racial unrest and, and, and disease unrest and uncertainty, is that going to stop the mission? Many pastors have famously said that the church is the hope of the world. Now, if you want to parse words, I don't believe the church is the hope of the world. I believe Jesus is the hope of the world. Do you agree? But the church was Jesus' idea. He said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said he would build it. And if you read all of scripture, he uses men, women, young and old to be a part of building that church. And how do we build the church? We're not talking about more bricks and mortar. We're talking about more disciples, people growing deeper in their faith, people taking opportunities to love God and love people by serving, by sharing, by being transformed and letting other people see them as being transformed, right? Whoa, this is why I'm in this job. And this mission doesn't stop. And it certainly can't go into neutral. It can't go into neutral. There's another scripture that jumped out at me, and I just feel like I'm supposed to share it. It's in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8. The prophet Isaiah says these words to us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. The grass withers, the flower fades. What does that mean? That means that all of this will go away. The uncertainty, the chaos. But more than that, our civilization will go away. Your home, my home, our homes, it'll go away. Our future, our fears, our anxiety, our jobs. This one might hurt a little bit. And I know it's strange coming from me because I'm usually not a straight shooter. You will go away. That's what this means when it says the grass withers and the flower fades. It's saying that all of this life, all of these things, all of these concerns, they're temporal. But you know what lasts forever? God and his word. That's what lasts forever. And so when you start connecting the dots through these scriptures, you know, Jesus said the gates of hell won't prevail against this church he's building. That's part of his word. That means that this church that he's building will last forever. And I'm not just talking about this physical church. I'm talking about all of those who've called on the name of Jesus in every time and place and nation and language. That will last forever. That will last. Everything else is just going to go away. Now, that's a hard thing. Uh, to grasp that you and I essentially are expendable. We're expendable. We're expendable assets to the kingdom. Does that hurt your feelings? I'm expendable. I, I've said it numerous times, and I believe this. And, and uh, when my friend first shared this with me as his life motto, he was a mentor, and I accepted it as mine as well. This is my goal in life. Preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. You know why? Because the grass withers, and so does John. The flower fades, and so does John. But the word of God will stand forever. I'm expendable. I'm expendable. 
There's millions of better preachers than me on this earth right now. I'm expendable. And if I'm expendable and we believe this, we start living with that mentality. That means all of us are expendable. What are we hanging on to stuff for? The Apostle Paul in his letters uh, uh, wrote to Timothy and he said, I, and, and he was in prison at the time and he knew he was coming to the end of it, or he was at the end of his ministry except for writing letters because he's in prison. He was coming to the end of his life. He knew that that death sentence was looming and he's still sharing the gospel and still writing parts of the Bible, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit and sending out these letters. And he said to Timothy, I am being poured out like a drink offering. That was Paul. And he was just being just like Jesus, who poured himself out. So, are we a church in limbo? Well, if we're a church that believes that the mission doesn't stop, and if we believe God's word, that all this goes away, but God's word is what's going to stand forever, the second thing that needs to be said is, I believe, church, that it's time to embrace the new normal. It's time to embrace the new normal. What do I mean by that? That this chaos, this uncertainty, this limbo state, it's life right now. And when I say it needs to be said that it's time to embrace the new normal, what I mean by that is that it's time to stop waiting for things to get back to like they were before. Does that ring true with anybody? I've been there. I've been there. How do you do staff meetings with staff at two different campuses via Zoom? And one guy's frozen on the screen, and another guy's talking, and then we lose him for a minute, and then when he comes back online, he's going, but little, 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 like buffering. I wish we could just go back to normal. Why can't we go back to the way things used to be? You know what? I used to accuse all the old folks of saying that all the time. (laughs) Shoes on the other foot, ain't it? Church, it needs to be said that it's time to embrace this as normal. So if the mission doesn't stop, and we're supposed to embrace the new normal, what does that look like? Now, here's another thing. I I don't want to just get up here this weekend and be a gunslinger. I'm I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but there was just a lot of different things. I felt like God was working in me. It was a stressful week, a lot going on. I'm trying to coach a soccer team and and, and be a pastor and do all of this thing. And by the way, coaching with a mask on in 85-degree heat, that's not fun. It slipped down here. It became a chin strap, you know, more than one. Mark up! I'm sorry, coach. Yeah. But you know... I give social media, or what I like to call emotional media, a hard time. But, you know, I I got a Facebook page, and I like to put a little fuel out there, a little funny something, a little whatever, every time, you know, maybe a thought for the week or a thought from the sermon, and and I can gauge kind of where we're at by how many hits it gets. Now, a long time ago, I decided my identity is not wrapped up in how many people like it or share it or so forth and so on. But I can get a pulse of where people are at depending on what I post, right? And so I posted something this week that uh, uh, it was a church sign. And a friend of mine, Lindsay, shared it with me. And it was some uh, church sign that said, uh, I want to be like uh, the Apostle Paul and, and something. And I'm messing it up. But be on the road to demask us, Right? <laughs> Some of you, a lot of you saw that because it got like 2,000, I don't know, almost 3,000 hits. Everybody's like, oh, that's hilarious. And that's the worst church sign ever. That's like the worst dad joke ever, right? And then, and then uh, a couple days later, you know, I shared a picture of, of my son sighting in his deer rifle because youth hunt's coming up. Everybody fired up about that? Nobody? I'm fired up about that. If it's brown, it's down. 270 will do the job, right? And a bunch of people, oh, that's so cute, and da da da. And I don't know, it was almost, it was 900. I don't know, it was climb, climbing. Between those two posts, I shared an introspective post, and it was a news article, and this is what it said. The headline was, "Worship 
or, or participate in corporate worship even if there's no child care. And the subtitle was, if we only worship when it's convenient, we will teach our children to do the same thing. Guess how many hits? Less than 300. Less than 300. We don't want to hear that stuff. Because we're a nation, myself included. We love convenience. We love normal. We love easy. I've told you, I... My vehicle may be a used vehicle, but in a couple months, I'll be so glad to hit that button with the this, this steering wheel warmer because I need it, right? And I know that times are tough, and this is not for folks who are at risk, but for those of us who are not, in regards to a church being in limbo, we say, no, the mission doesn't stop. In regards to our convenience, we need to embrace the new normal. Regardless of what things we have to do or we don't want to do. There's a friend of mine, a really close friend. He's in a fight club table that I've uh, been a part of for the last two years. And... If I could describe him, my friend is more against masks than you are. My friend carries a copy of the United States Constitution around just in case he's ever pulled over by a cop. You know the type yet? He's like Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. He can live off the grid. I don't want to get him in, in trouble, but he, he believes uh, income taxes are unconstitutional. I'm not painting a picture for you yet, right? And, uh, and you know what side of this issue he's on. It was a couple months ago. It was right when, in fact, it was right before we had our first live services in Manistee and here in Buckley. And we were struggling. We were struggling to find ushers, struggling to find volunteers. It's like... Talk about a church in limbo. It's like the volunteer force just evaporated and we're all unavailable. And then there was this little thing that, that could cause a bunch of arguments. And do not send me a single message or text about this. But our staff took the decision that ushers were going to wear masks. And we had a bunch of folks say, no, I, sorry, sorry, I ain't even coming. I know I've been an usher, but I'm not, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. Well, my friend overheard that conversation. You know what he said to me? He said, you need ushers? I said, yeah. I said, but they have to wear masks. I know where you stand. And I was just messing with him. It was after a fight club. And he said, I won't wear a mask in Home Depot, but I'll wear a mask for Jesus. Sign me up. Sign me up. And about 50% of the time these last weeks, he's been serving here in Buckley on the weekends with a mask, and he hates masks. But you see, he gets it. The mission doesn't stop. Church is bigger than his agenda. Church is even bigger than his conviction. He's embraced the new normal. And he's saying, I'll do that for my king. Because... If I do that, then the doors can open. Maybe someone comes in, hears the message of the gospel. Maybe their life's changed. You guys, the formula of the church hasn't changed in 2,000 years. We come together, whether we own the place or don't own the place, either in a building that we built or a factory that we've repurposed or, or wherever, we sing some songs, we fellowship together, we pray, we bring our sacrifices, our offerings, we hear the gospel preached, our lives are transformed. We're part of the community. And there's something magic when that happens. Actually, it's not magic. It's supernatural. Where two or three or more are gathered in my name. I'm right there with them. The Holy Spirit shows up. We're moved and transformation begins. But it doesn't just end there, right? 
It happens in our kids' programs. It happens with our student ministry. I gave my life back to Jesus. at four. I'd become a Christian when I was seven, but I gave my life back to Jesus at age 14 at a youth event. I was mentored by a youth pastor, right? I went on a missions trip. I experienced all of those things. I stand here before you today a product of the church ghetto, the same tired formula that's 2,000 years old that ain't broke yet. We use drums now, praise God. (laughs) We have better screens now, praise God. You don't have to wear a tie unless it's a, you know, wedding or, you know, Tim's doing a funeral. He dresses up nice. But it's the same thing. The mission doesn't stop. I don't want to be a church in limbo. And last but not least, there's there's one more passage I want to share with you because You probably see where I'm going, and and many of us, when we say, hey, listen, it's time to step up and be a part of the Michigan uh, uh, again. It's time to step up and find a place to serve. It's, It's time to embrace the new normal and be a part of this. There's so many holes to fill. I told the leadership team this past week, I feel like we've been pruned. Our church has been pruned. Pruning is a good thing. And it's not just because I'm a, you know, a, a the glass is half full guy. Pruning is a good thing. That means new life is about ready to explode. But only if we believe the mission doesn't stop and we, you and I, embrace the new normal and we got to get after it. We got to get after it. Probably the number one thing that I hear people Give is a reason for not getting after it. What do I mean by getting after it? Uh, There's opportunities uh, uh, to lead a women's Bible study. There's opportunities to be a part of a fight club or to become a leader within fight club. There's opportunities to to be a part of of restarting our tab kids programs. There's opportunities as we're we're ready to light a huge fire and get foundry really rolling in Manistee and, and, and kicking off again here in Buckley to invest in young people. To be a leader, to be a a walking taco dispenser. You haven't been to Foundry, so you didn't think that was funny. I've seen young and old at Foundry. I've seen young and old involved in in Tab Kids. We, We need more people to show up and be a part of the band. Yeah, we need more band people in Buckley, in Manistee, production people. We need all of those things. Here's the number one reason I hear of why someone doesn't. And it usually has to do with, I'm not good enough. I'm a mess. Well, as soon as I get my life squared away, well, you know, if I can just stop sinning, good luck with that one. You know, if I knew more about the Bible, I don't know anything, you know, I can't even find my Bible. We feel unworthy. We feel weak. We feel powerless. We feel that it's someone else should do it because somehow we're not qualified. Thankfully, we got some verses. If you still have a Bible, flip over to 1 Corinthians real quick. Chapter 1. We'll just share three with you. Paul's speaking to the church of Corinth. And if you read all of chapter 1, he says, and to, the, and to the saints everywhere. So we've already established that. If you're a Christian, you're a saint, and you're everywhere. So congratulations. This letter's to you. And this is what God's Spirit says to us through his servant Paul, verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So I would say if that's your feeling, I've got a low amount of time. I got a low tolerance for inconvenience. 
I feel weak. I feel unworthy. You don't know about my past. What will people say if I was ever to step up? Everyone knows me in this town or that town or, oh, no, not me. I'm unqualified. It needs to be said that God uses the foolish. Congratulations. You are qualified by your own confession. Have you ever felt low? Yes or no? You're qualified. Have you ever felt weak? Yes or no? You are qualified. Have you ever felt despised? Yes or no? You're qualified. Have you ever felt foolish when it comes to the things of God? Yes or no? But do you know him? God uses fools. God uses the foolish things to shame the wise. He he uses foolish things to bring down the strong. Do you know how foolish people think we are as a church? But we're shining that light in dark times. How foolish we are to meet and take risks. We're shining that light in a dark, dark time. And the darker it gets, the brighter we're supposed to shine. God uses foolish things. He uses foolish men that don't know their way around the Bible. He uses foolish women who are like, oh, I just got all my kids out of the house. I can't imagine going and helping with tab kids or the nursery and discipling someone else's kids. That's a foolish thing to do. Guess what? We need some foolish people to make some foolish decisions because the mission doesn't stop. The mission doesn't stop. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to do it. Brian Williams, worship leader, is a beloved staff member and had a pretty good thing going here. This weekend, he's celebrating his last weekend because he's doing something really, really, really foolish. He wants to plant a church in Traverse City that's a little bit different. Well, God uses foolish things. And Brian's being foolish, and he's making a foolish decision in the eyes of the world. But if it is of God, God will build it, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. It's part of this thing called church. So friends... Is God calling you to be foolish and make a really, really, really foolish decision? I asked our campus pastors, what do we need? And they're like, everything. We got to rebuild women's Bible study from the ground up. And I know there's a bunch of women, but I don't know the Bible that well. Can you press play on your computer? Can you organize little brownies and doilies and cookies and invite everybody and be administrative and tell them when and where? You can do that for knitting club. You can do that for your garage sale team. You can do that when you're hanging out by the pool. Could you do that? We need some foolish women to make a foolish decision and be coordinators and directors and hostesses. And maybe, God forbid, open your mouth and tell others what you know about the Bible. It's been a while since we kicked ladies. We kick men all the time. Ladies, I love you and you're welcome. We need some ladies to make some foolish decisions. We need men to make some foolish decisions. I know there's a lot of men that were foolish enough to try Fight Club for the first time, and then they spend you know, three years in Fight Club, and then they were like, well, I didn't get anything out of it, so now you know, it doesn't fit with my life, and I'm too busy. Well, we need you to be foolish again, because the reason you weren't getting out of it, anything out of it anymore is because you were just a taker the whole time, and really what God wanted you to do is start your own Fight Club. He wanted you to lead one with another buddy, because you learned a lot in those three years, but you got all filled up, and like after Thanksgiving dinner went, mm, thanks, got to go. We need some men who will make a foolish decision and help us rebuild Fight Club post-pandemic. We got to rebuild Tab Kids in both Manistee and in Buckley because we're going to phase back into having nursery and toddler and, and a rocking Tab Kids program like we used to have. But we need foolish people to worship one hour and serve one hour. Oh, it would be so much more convenient if I could just go to my favorite church service and then get out. No, we do that. We teach our kids to do the same. 
We need some foolish men and women and college students. Oh, we haven't kicked college students in a while. Oh, young adults, 20-somethings. Why isn't there anything for 20-somethings at our church? Well, there is, and you didn't come to it. But um, sorry, was it, sorry, do I get a yellow card for that? Yeah, there's only about 15 that showed. But, but they want it to be there. They just don't want to go to it every week. That's what they really want, right? Well, how do you make a church your church? You get involved. And you know what? Praise God, we have some 20-somethings, a lot of them, that are keeping our student ministry program going. How foolish is that? They should be out enjoying their life before they have kids of their own. Because you know when that happens, <laughs> but they're not. They're investing in our kids before they have their own kids. How foolish. Praise God. What's God saying to you? We need some foolish people who aren't afraid to be a fool for Christ this week to contact their campus pastor or whoever will answer the phone at your campus and say, where do you need me? What can I do? Where do I sign up? The mission doesn't stop. I'm going to embrace the new normal. I'm not going to have a list of demands. If you want me to wear a mask, I'll wear it, hanging around my ears, do whatever. But God uses the foolish. Aren't you glad he uses the foolish? My time's done, but I'm just going to say, if, if you really did a deep dive into the resumes of every one of our staff members, <laughs> there's about two, no, maybe one, that you'd say, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. The rest of us, how in the world did he or she or they how foolish. But you know what? They were foolish enough to say yes. They're foolish enough to say yes. And God uses foolish things. So if you felt low, if you felt despised, if you feel weak, if you feel unqualified, we've got news for you. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, I thank you for your word that is timeless over thousands of years who you promised it would never fade away, that it would always be true. Not just parts of it, but all of it. God, I thank you for your church, that it was your idea, that it can be a beacon of light in darkness even now. It can be a bastion of truth in the midst of uncertainty. God, I thank you for the mission that you've entrusted us to that can look conventional like this church and can look unconventional like Restoration Church. God, that it's of every nation and every tongue and every tribe. God, would you help get us out of our limbo state, if we've been in limbo? God, would you give us courage and passion, and would your spirit inspire men and women and young and old and students to again load up and charge the gates of hell with squirt guns? They're lost people that even in this time, they're being born they're going to school, still working. We're living and we're dying. And all that life doesn't stop because we don't know which way's up. But God, would you help us to look to you and mount up and ride to the sound of the battle to build your kingdom, to build your church, no matter what the cost. So God, I pray many of us would make a really, really foolish decision this week. Foolish in the world's eyes. For your glory and for our joy. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray.